everyone to our September Bax Community of Practice monthly webinar. I am Tiffany Oliver. I am a professor of biology at Spelman College, as well as a Jefferson Science Fellow, serving as an advisor in the Office of Global Food Security, the U.S. State Department. This month's webinar entitled Stewards of the Land, Supporting Smallholder Farmers to Build Healthy Soil, Adapt to Climate Change, and Solve Global Hunger, will delve into critical intersections between soil health, climate adaption, and global hunger. This month's webinar is hosted by the Alliance to End Hunger and the One Acre Fund. Before I begin, I wanna take a moment and uh, turn it over to the VAX Partnership for any updates. Definitely. Thank you so much, Tiffany, and um, thank you everyone for attending. I'm Daniela Vega, and I act as the uh, VAX Executive Secretary for um, the partnership. This is the CGIR Summit FAO Partnership for Advancing the VAX Movement, and I also serve as the Chief of Staff to the Director General in CIMIT. So just wanted to provide a little bit of update here. As you remember, the partnership is uh, aimed to provide by the platform for global coordination and advancement of the uh, movement, leveraging from technical expertise. This includes, of course, the VAX community of practice that serves as a pillar to shape the VAX policy agenda and advance our priorities at a local, national, and, and international levels. So as we are aiming to strengthen this local engagement and keep the issues very relevant at the table, we're leveraging from FAO's capacities and also from the CGIR community um, and networks to make sure that the agenda can leverage on the ground as well as in the policy sphere. So just wanted to provide a little bit of an, of an update here. We were able to meet most of you though that were in Kigali last month in the Africa, uh, sorry, earlier this month, I'm already, uh, ahead of myself. So the Africa Food Systems Forum, um, just a couple of weeks ago, um, the VAX community of practice had a meetup um, during the forum and in the event provided the at the least the opportunity to network and also provided the um, opportunity for us to, to interact. And then the next um, event that we're looking forward to meet with all of you and have this reunion and assembly of um, the VAX community of practice is uh, this in-person reception next Monday here in New York for the UN General Assembly uh, on the sidelines of the UN General Assembly events. So this event will occur directly after the Business Council for International Understanding side event where VAX is also going to be prominently um, featured. So we're looking to see everyone who can attend who is in New York for this um, event. Also, just wanted to provide a little bit of an update on the VAX Community of Practice Working Groups update. So as my as you might remember, we're having these policy papers that are going to be presented at the Boardwalk Dialogue event that's uh, together with the World Food Price Foundation at the end of October. So we have identified six uh, priority topics that are gonna be presented there as a product from the community of practice. Two uh, co-leads have been identified for each of these uh, topics. And then uh, we have already organized some sprint sessions so that everyone in the community of practice can provide feedback and incorporate that into the policy papers. So two of those have been already hosted. Um, so that's the value chain creation, creation and the sustainable land use. We're still uh, working on the soil management, which is scheduled for September 25th. And then three sessions will be remaining for that feedback. So please stay tuned and we hope to get and gather all of your information as well. So that's just a little bit of, of what's uh, happened, or what has happened in the last weeks um, since we met last time. And we are very happy and excited to have our co-hosts for today's session. Thank you, Tiffany, back to you. And now I would like to turn it over to Eric Mitchell. Presidents for the Alliance to End Hunger. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Again, my name is Eric Mitchell. I'm the president of the Alliance to End Hunger. Before we begin, I want to extend a heartfelt thank you to all of you who have joined us um, today for this very important conversation. Your presence and support are greatly appreciated. I would also like to uh, send a special thanks to Dr. Tiffany Oliver at the State Department for her efforts in helping to make this event possible. We deeply appreciate her dedication and support in putting all of this together. 
I also want to acknowledge our esteemed speakers today, Dr. Olu Segan, Yerukun, and Claire Brosnihan. Ms. Brosnihan is, is joining us from the One Acre Fund, and she represents one of our key member organizations, which has been instrumental in our work on climate and adaptation and resilience. Another of our valued partners, the Farm Journal Foundation, has been actively collaborating with the Rwanda Institute for Conservation Agriculture, also known as RICA, from whom we'll also be hearing uh, from today. Uh, the Alliance in Hunger is a diverse coalition of over 100 companies, nonprofits, foundations, universities, and others who are all united in a shared commitment to ending hunger both in the United States and globally. Together, we combine our strengths across sectors to address today's most pressing hunger and malnutrition challenges while working to solve the root causes of hunger at home and abroad. The administration's vision for adopted crops and soils, also known as VACs, aligns closely with much of what uh, the recent work that the Alliance has been focusing on uh, this past year. As we are all aware, climate change is having a profound effect on global agriculture. While mitigating the impacts of climate change remains critical, we must also prioritize ensuring that smallholder farmers can adapt to these changes effectively. It is imperative that farmers and communities, it is imperative that farmers and communities around the world have access to the necessary resources, not only to feed our growing populations, but also to adapt to the evolving environmental landscape. At the Alliance, we recognize the unique opportunity we have right now to foster a bipartisan approach to addressing the urgent challenges posed by climate and hunger. There is tremendous potential for collaboration on these critical issues across multiple sectors. I'm excited about today's discussions and the insights that we will gain from uh, each other. I am confident that together we will move closer to developing impactful solutions to, for global hunger and climate resilience. Now it's my pleasure to introduce our speakers for today. Dr. Olusegun Yerukun serves as the Deputy Vice Chancellor for Academic Affairs at the Rwanda Institute for Conservation Agriculture. He is a distinguished soil scientist specializing in soil fertility and applied soil chemistry. Today, he will share with us Rika's work in conservation agriculture. Claire Brosnihan is the climate food systems, and gender lead at One Acre Fund. She brings valuable experience in partnerships around soil health initiatives and regenerative agriculture. Claire will be speaking to us about financing models for soil health among smallholder farmers. I'll now turn over to Dr. Yurikon. Okay, uh, good afternoon, thank you. Are you able to hear me? There is some feedback. Do you have possibly two microphones on? Okay. Can you hear me now? Yeah, the feedback's off. Okay. That works. That's beautiful. Thank you. Nice video. Okay, let me see if I can just, uh, I'm going to share a uh, screen. Sorry. Just share screen. Sorry. Mm. Yeah, you can see my shared screen now. I think. So we're just trying to adjust. Uh, I think that should be okay. We can see everything clearly. I think they can see and. Uh, well, great. As uh, 
Rwanda Institute for Conservation and Agriculture. We are happy to join you uh, this afternoon on our side. And our objective uh, is to present our institute you know, to the community and to indicate some of the work that we have been doing. Uh, I can go to four. So our mission is to educate and inspire a new generation of innovators in agriculture. And um, I'm trying to go to full screen as well. Yeah. Um, it's not presenting. Oh, okay, great. So um, the Rwanda Institute for Conservation Agriculture is essentially an agricultural institution. It is a partnership between the government of Rwanda and the Howard G. Buffett Foundation. Uh, this idea was mooted in 2015 and we became operational about 2018, 2019. And the background was really to address issues of environmental degradation affecting you know, food security. And we are based in Rwanda, where it's a land of a thousand uh, hills. And so you have uh, you know, the sloping land with erosion and extensive you know, soil loss. But the objective of the government and the Howard G. Buffett Foundation is really uh, to look at addressing the issue of food and nutrition security. And so RICA, as we call our institution, was established. Essentially, we offer a Bachelor of Science degree in conservation agriculture, and our systems, our students are able to specialize in one of four areas, animal production systems, crop production systems, food processing systems, or irrigation and mechanization you know, systems. It's a four-year program, but it is offered in a three-year period. Each one of the courses that we offer in the program has to have a component of one of our four threads. And this you can see. Conservation agriculture is a primary thread, which means that elements of conservation agriculture are taught and learned in those courses. One Health, Entrepreneurship, and Communication are also you know, taught in those courses. Okay. Dr. Hirakun, can I just ask you, at the top of your screen where you see display settings, could you click that for me? Uh, Do you see where it says display settings? Display settings. It's at the top towards the left of your screen. What's the left? Maybe you... at the uh, Go up a little further. Right. Display, display settings. Settings. Yes, that. Yes. Uh-huh. Okay. If you click that and then swap. Yes, that yeah. one. Yes. Okay. And then you have to, there we go. Perfect. Thank you. Please proceed. Okay. Thank you. All right. So essentially, our education philosophy is experiential learning, which means that our students learn you know, by doing. And essentially, about 50% of the credit hours you know, uh, earned in the program is earned in the field, in the laboratory, but you know, hands-on there. The model is a land-grant model, teaching research and extension, and we try to adhere as closely as possible to that. Uh, we admit 84 students uh, per year, and so we have a total of about 250 uh, students in the institution. Our vision ultimately is to be a world leader in experiential education and conservation agriculture is the foundation of everything that we do, and hopefully we will contribute to attaining sustainable food security. We recognize the challenges of climate change and environmental degradation, and so we aim through our teaching and learning to upgrade and skill our students to be prepared to reverse soil loss and environmental degradation, to contribute to increasing you know, food productivity and nutrition security, starting with Rwanda and fanning out into Eastern Africa and the rest of Africa. We actively promote conservation in agricultural systems in everything that we do. And we aim to ingrain climate change adaptation in our students and their learning. So how are we doing this you know, so far? We are an academic institution. 
And so we are training students and we believe we are contributing extensively to raising the number of local expertise who are well informed and their knowledge is enhanced around climate change and conservation agriculture. We have faculty who are engaged in applied research. We have a long-term ecology research site you know, where we are looking at various uh, production systems within Rwanda, testing it under conservation agriculture and hoping to be able to contribute additional information in the fight against uh, deteriorating you know, land use uh, here. We also look at other pertinent you know, topics relating to conservation agriculture. Uh, for instance, you know, weed control, insect control, those kinds of things. We have also started to ramp up on our extension you know, activities. So generally, we work with farmers in the locality. Uh, we have established up to about you know, 80 model you know, uh, plots with uh, lead farmers so that in their own areas, other farmers are able to come and see how conservation agriculture is practiced and how it ought to be practiced. We also have a big partnership uh, with uh, a cooperative, you know, where uh, they use a center pivot irrigation and we are beginning to gradually convert land under that pivot, or under those pivots as well you know, to conservation agriculture. We are working with some government projects to develop training materials uh, focused on conservation agriculture and land you know, management. So this is part of our uh, extension engagement with the community. And so there we have teaching, we have research, and we have extension going on uh, in our programs. So essentially, this is what we wanted to introduce uh, as to who we are, and some of the picture you see is some of our own land uh, under conservation you know, agricultural practice and even at a commercial uh, scale. And so we're about five years old in terms of our curriculum. We have graduated one cohort of students. Another cohort will graduate in a couple of, in another week. And so we will have two sets who have graduated. And so slowly and gradually, uh, we are beginning to promote the concept of conservation agriculture, of experiential learning, and to increase the numbers of practitioners who can actively engage in that field. And so this is what we bring to the table, and we will be happy to join uh, the community and participate in some of your activities. Thank you for your time. Great. Thank, thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Yuvon. Claire, uh, go ahead. Sure. Um, let me just share my screen. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Claire Brosnahan, and I'm originally from a farming community in northeastern Nebraska. I spent 11 years uh, living in Rwanda, so I'm really thrilled to be here today with our partners from RICA. Um, I worked for One Acre Fund and also worked on a regenerative agriculture project for SMB. Um, I'm now based in Italy, and today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about our perspectives on financing models to support soil health enhancement among smallholder farmers. So just a little bit about One Acre Fund, um, in case you're um, not familiar with us. We work in 10 countries in Sub-Saharan Africa. We are a nonprofit social enterprise, and we typically serve extreme poor, typically women-led staple crop farm families in rural East and Southern Nigeria, um, Southern Africa plus Nigeria. Um, we currently serve um, almost 5 million smallholder farmers across these 10 countries. And um, basically in our model, we try to overcome the barriers that smallholder farmers face in getting bigger harvests and more prosperous futures. So we take life improving technologies like diverse seeds, fertilizer, improved storage bags, and occasionally non-agricultural products like solar lights. We finance them on credit, manage the risk through insurance. We distribute them to the very last mile and we provide high quality interactive trainings to farmers in the communities where we serve. Um, and we also do some market facilitation. 
Um, I think our key insight here is that we really need this chain to work together. That's where the magic is. When all of these, the products and services um, are uh, working all together. Um, and we find that if farmers can't access credit, you know, the rest of the chain sort of um, falls off. If they can't access training, it's not really that helpful to provide financing or inputs if they don't know how to use them. Um, you know, if farmers are suffering from climate change and they lose their full harvest, they really need to be protected by crop insurance. And so we see this whole market bundle as really um, essential to helping farmers get um, bigger harvests and more prosperous futures. Um, over the years, we've also deepened our partnerships work um, to increase our impact. So that includes agroforestry, which can help farmers diversify their farms. We just planted our 250 millionth tree um, via smallholder farmers in April. We've also added re rural retail and DUCA channels um, in a few of our countries where farmers can go there and access farm inputs. We've partnered with several governments to improve extension services. And we've also done some commercialization work um, to help smallholder farmers um, gain access to um, premium markets. Um, and I think it's helpful to center, um, you know, this conversation around smallholder farmers. Um, One Acre Fund's motto is farmers first. And so I want to tell a little bit of a story about a farmer that I visited a few months ago in Rwanda. Um, uh, I visited a farmer named Francine Tuishimire um, in Eastern Rwanda, where One Acre Fund has trials on conservation agriculture practices um, designed to fight erosion and build soil organic matter. We're really trying to figure out, like Rika, the optimum evidence-based recommendations that will help smallholders like Francine um, improve their soil health, but also will be economically viable. Um, and when I spoke to Francine, she spoke about how she didn't see her bean fields that were planted with conservation agriculture techniques start to outperform conventional fields until almost two years after, after she joined the research trial, once the soil organic matter had been built up. And during those two years, Francine had to increase her labor costs on the conservation ag trials in comparison to the control, and yields weren't as impressive on the trial plots. And then fast forward two years, and Francine said that she's now seeing a lot of those positive changes in her yields, her soils, and the pest disease burden. And she said that if she were given the choice, she would have continued with the cover crop and minimal tillage practices that she's been experimenting with. So one thing that we're, um, we're dealing with right now is just thinking through how we can support farmers like Francine invest in these beneficial practices that do have positive effects on soil health um, and can help her transition to more sustainable farming models. But there's a lot of unknowns around who pays and who benefits um, and, and how does that all work when it comes to financing um, for soil health for smallholders in Africa. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about that on the next slide. So I think we're kind of getting to the point now, I hope, where governments, NGOs, philanthropy, um, advocacy groups, universities and research institutions like RICA, we're all getting to this consensus about needing to urgently invest in soil health and adaptive crops. I think everyone's understanding that that's really key for food security, both today and in the future, for environmental protection, for sequestering carbon, all of these things. Um, but we're we're seeing that there's maybe a few myths about financing for soil health in the smallholder context. Um, and I wanted to bust some myths today. Um, so I think myth number one is just that um, corporates are going to um, use private fin financing to fund this soil health transition. And we really don't see a lot of money from um, corporate entities coming and um, working with smallholder farmers on soil health outside of a few premium value chains like coffee or cacao. But for staple crop farmers, there's really still a funding gap there. Um, and that's sort of a myth we wanna to bust today. I think myth number two, um, that soil-based carbon credits can already significantly subsidize these farmer transitions. I think there's still a lot of issues around the MRV for soil health um, and um, a lot of our smallholders rent land um, and there's questions about how long um, soil carbon can be sequestered. Um, so I think we have a long way to go to actually making that a reality for smallholders. 
Um, myth number three, that African governments can fully subsidize um, a lot of these soil health investments for themselves. I think that they have a lot of debt and a lot of competing priorities now, and we, we really need more funding in this space flowing to smallholder farmers um, for soil health for adaptive crops. Um, I would say that we likely need an all of the above strategy. Um, we need more innovative financing models and we need more money for soil health and adaptive crops. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit further um, about um, what these specific needs are. So taking it back to um, the farmer in Rwanda that I visited, Francine, she has multiple needs that need to be met simultaneously to make sure that she can appropriately invest in her soil health. So she needs soil health extension support and training based on evidence-based practices. That requires a trained extension worker who can provide really trusted quality um, support and R&D costs to make sure that those trainings are really scientifically sound and appropriate to that farmer's soil and climate. Francine, our farmer, she needs financing and credit to make sure that she can buy really top quality bean seed, um, or if she's planting cover crops, those can be quite expensive and not very available on the local market, so she may need financing for that. Um, she needs market access for climate smart crops to help her move beyond subsistence farming and to provide economic stability to her family. Um, and so these are just a few of the, the needs and the constraints that we're, we're seeing. Um, and now I'm going to share with you um, just three quick solutions about how One Acre Fund thinks about innovative financing um, models for soil health. Um, so um, this is just how One Acre Fund sort of thinks about our own financial um, model. So in order to meet the five, nearly five million smallholders um, needs, we use a blended finance model. Um, so we found it's a really effective way to deploy financing for soil health. Um, we use grants for impact generating activities, and then we use debt for working capital. So there's you know, a big time lag in between when we need to buy farm inputs and when smallholder farmers are making loan repayments on their microfinance loans. So we use debt for that working capital period. Um, and we think that this is really helpful. You know, if we needed grants for that amount of working capital that we use, we would have to reach um, far fewer farmers. Um, we estimate about 53% fewer farmers if we weren't able to have um, this blended financing model that allows us to really stretch um, every grant dollar that we have coming in. Um, just another um, financing solution that we use um, is through our venture building model. So um, we have a venture building and impact fund called Smallholder Resilience Ventures that's really trying to um, help develop this missing middle. Um, so, um, as Dr. Yerakun spoke about in his presentation, erosion is a huge problem in Rwanda. Everyone knows it's the land of a thousand hills. Um, and so that's causing a lot of economic losses, a lot of soil health problems in the country. Um, well, how can you, um, you know, give farmers incentives to act on erosion? One of the solutions is through planting trees. Um, so what Smallholder Resilience Ventures has done in Rwanda um, is um, has been supporting diversification into high value, climate resistant, resilient crops and supporting the climate smart production of those crops. So um, to give an example is um, we work in avocado processing um, in Rwanda. We've invested in avocado oil processing and avocado export SMEs. Um, that gives farmers an incentive to plant um, avocados on their land that may be really erosion prone. Um, and so by helping develop that, that whole mechanism, um, they have more of an incentive to take um, actions that are beneficial for their land overall. Um, so trying to um, create sort of a virtuous cycle here. Um, and then the last example that I'll talk about is um, we really believe in the value of partnerships. Um, we just think that these are really key to fully unlock scale and help smallholders overcome their soil health uh, challenges. So one example is that in Rwanda, um, farmers also have extremely acidic soils, um, which can lower yields. So you can apply lime or travertine um, to help reduce the acidity, but many smallholder farmers, um, one, can't afford to buy lime and two, may lack physical access to it. 
Um, it's a heavy product. So farmers uh, need to not only visit that shop um, and maybe it's not very close to their house, they actually need to carry huge bags of lime up and down Rwanda's thousand hills and apply it. So these were really big barriers um, on both affordability and access. So what One Acre Fund did is um, we have a partnership um, where the Rwandan government provides a lime subsidy to make it more affordable for smallholder farmers. One Acre Fund provides um, more credit to farmers to increase that affordability even further. Um, and then we offer lime delivery, um, and we have for many years down to the village level within walking distance of farmers. And now we're trying to take that even further and even doing trials on direct delivery of lime to farmers' fields via bicycles to see if that can really boost adoption even further and tackle this problem of acidic soils. So we really believe that a successful partnership like this can unlock a lot more scale and impact on soil health. So that's all for me. Great, thanks so much, Claire. Um, and thanks, Dr. Yerkun for the presentations today. Um, even with uh, starting a little bit late, we're, we're right on time for questions and answers. And so what I wanted to do is give um, the audience plenty of time to ask questions and, and our panelists can um, give you their insights into these questions. I would just start off with a couple, one for each, and then we'll open it up to all of you. So um, Dr. Yerkun, um, you were talking about your organization being in place uh, as a partnership um, with the government of Rwanda and the Howard Buffett Foundation for about 10 years, and then you've been doing some of the education work for about five years and really changing the next generation and get, educating them on conservation agriculture and, and what they can do uh, in terms of that and how they can pass that along to the next generation. What success have you seen over the last uh, five to 10 years um, with respect to growing support for conservation agriculture? And what have been some of the biggest obstacles to that? Uh, yeah, thank you, uh, Blake. Uh, so in the period that we've you know, been operating, again, as a knowledge-based institution, uh, one of our first successes we would think is, you know, the increase in the number of uh, young people in agriculture who have the awareness around you know, land you know, management using conservation uh, agriculture, you know, environmental you know, protection. So that diffusion of knowledge is critical because we see our students go back to their home bases and they are trying a lot of what they are learning you know, with their own uh, home farms and gardens. So again, I, I think that's, uh, you know, the diffusion is a, again a success in itself. We also see that, you know, we are creating knowledgeable people. Uh, some of our graduates, for instance, who are now working with, you know, agricultural organizations, uh, and they are, you know, getting to be lead people, leading voices in, uh, you know, uh, conservation uh, issues. That is one. Uh, secondly, uh, with the farmers, as I indicated, we are establishing you know, what we call model farms. And you know, we are all well aware that farmers uh, tend to learn you know, more and faster from one another. They trust each other. And so by creating these model farmers you know, with conservation agricultural practices, we are seeing slowly a gradual movement of farmers around one another, uh, inquisitive and adopting. So again, we are an education institution so diffusion of uh, information is useful. The partnerships that we're building locally are also important. For instance, with One Acre Fund, uh, using a conservation approach, even in their own you know, seed uh, production uh, you know, operations, but also with their own farmers. Um, so we also have government projects that we're working with. Uh, RICA has been identified to lead some of the development of the training materials uh, in this you know, environmental management uh, projects that we collaborate on. So we see those as you know, some of the successes that we're scoring, uh, again, albeit from the education you know, sector, but with our involvement in research and extension. What are some of the challenges? Well, uh, you know, Rwanda has a high youth population. And so the stigma around agriculture as a career 
uh, is one of the challenges that you know we face. Uh, so hopefully our students uh, will help us neutralize you know some of that uh, there. Uh, adoption rates of technologies are not very huge with farmers. They are slow, you know, they are deliberate. Uh, and so we would like to see a faster uh, turnaround, but you know, I think slowly uh, we are making some inroads in there. Our approach to education, which is experiential learning, it's also heavy on capital uh, resources. And so the, the number of students that we can take in at a time is also limited. And I think that limits also the extent of our you know, expansion uh, in time. There are still many research questions that are you know, to be answered around conservation you know, agriculture. We are young, we are learning from others, but we're making some you know, contributions as well. So these are some of the challenges which we see on the ground currently. Uh, but certainly, you know, we continue to work to address you know, as many of them as we can. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Yerkun. Um, I'm going to ask Claire a quick question, but I did see a hand raise. I think it was by Naziz, but I can't see it now. Is there a question um, that came up? I did see a hand raise, and I don't know if they can put that in the chat or they can be unmuted. I don't see a question in the chat, but I did just want to say, if we can, everyone, if you have a question for Blake or any of our panelists, please just raise your hand. And then once you're acknowledged, unmute and ask your question. I do see Gerald has his hand up. Apologies, I'm playing, trying to figure out the figures here. Yeah, well, so I, I agree with you guys. The thing is, when it comes to the small older farmers, I think we should uh, have a different stance to this as well as to the financing of it. As you know, there's waste streams, there's all other kinds of, kinds of um, ways that the farm itself, if he's educated in technologies, can, can extract these chemicals and um, let's call it renewable fuels from um, biomass. And that can also assist in the uh, financing of his own uh, ventures. And then fully agree, you know, microeconomies is extremely important and we need, we need to connect these farmers together to form a grid where they can help each other and be independent and self-reliant. Thank you. Thanks, thanks very much for that question, Gerald. Um, was there another hand? Otherwise I can, I'll, I'll go to my next question. I don't see one. Okay, great. Claire, I wanted to turn to you for a second. Um, you, I, um, in looking at uh, the work that you guys do at the One Acre Fund, I had a question um, about if you had the right funding in place now, what could you be able to achieve over the next few years? And what do you think is possible? And, I, and one of the caveats I will say is that I think, you know, one of the, the biggest role of the Alliance is doing advocacy up on Capitol Hill, and we're trying to get support for adaptation, climate adaptation. And I think one of the challenges in Congress is that they want to see quick results. And so I know that both you and, and Dr. Yerkum were talking about it does take some time. And so, you know, if you did have the money, you know, what, what could you do? And then we can work to try to get support for those programs up on Capitol Hill. But yeah, what could you do with that? Thanks a lot. Sure. Um, in terms of where we want to go, um, we have four really big goals that we've set for 2030, um, if we're able to have the resources to, to pull that off. So by 2030, we want to serve 10 million smallholders um, across our countries of operation. We're already at a nearly 5 million now, and so we think that this is achievable. We want to create $1 billion per year in new farm profits and assets. Right now, we're creating about 420 one million US dollars in new prop, new farm profits and assets per year. So we all also think we're on, on track for that goal. Our third goal is to plant 1 billion uh, cumulative trees via smallholder farmers by 2030. We're at 250 uh, million cumulative trees as of April. So uh, that's on track as well. And then we want to make sure that um, our smallholder farmers are uh, doing at least three climate resilient interventions per farmer. 
So th those are things like compost, intercropping, crop rotation, um, diversifying their farms. So things that are really going to protect them from um, the climate changes that are that are here and are coming in the future. And so those are a few of the things that we want to be able to achieve um, by 2030. Thanks for that. Claire, sure, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I just want to make sure you saw Blake. There's a question from Rose in the Q and A. Oh, Did you see that? I don't see that yet, but let me. If you can read it, let's see. Let me pull it up. I see it in the chat. But, oh, one second. Sorry about that. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, there it is. Okay. Yes. Um, I do see that. Let me go to that, and then I see a couple of hands. But let me go to the quick question, and I see um, Yvonne has a hand raised. But the question from actually, uh, let's go really quickly to the hands raised, and then we'll go to Rose's question. Yvonne, mm -hmm. go ahead. Thank you, Blake. I, I think this is a question for, for Claire. Actually, Claire, it's nice to hear that One Acre Fund is doing work on, on agroforestry and on putting putting trees on farm. And obviously, this is something that's been on, on the global development agenda for, for 50 years, practically, right, from the time C4 was was founded in the late 70s. And, and upscaling these agroforestry systems has been a huge challenge and, and much too slow a process. And a lot of that is is coming down to finance and that kind of mismatch. And you know when a farmer starts to see a return on that investment, how, how they can kind of defray the cost of that investment. So I, I'd be very curious to hear how you're approaching that at One Acre Fund or working with government partners or with private sector, what are some of the kind of solutions that that you're looking at or, or even considering for the future, if not already implementing to, to make sure that these these systems become feasible for smallholders? Yeah, that's a great question. It's something that we've been working at um, for quite a few years. Um, we've tried and experimented with a few different models. Um, one, to try to increase soil, uh, to increase tree survival rates and then also to reduce the cost per seedling. Um, so like 10 years ago, the model that we were experimenting with was like one acre fund owned and operated nurseries. And now we found it more effective to work with um, nursery micro entrepreneurs all across the countries where um, we work. So we help them get started. They're the ones who raise the seedlings for us. Um, we teach them quality control and um, train them on how to grow the different types of trees that our farmers want. Um, and then One Acre Fund buys them and distributes them through partners. We found that one really effective um, way to do that is by partnering with the government. So both in Kenya and Rwanda, we've had really successful um, tree partnerships programs with um, the government. So for instance, in Rwanda, um, the agricultural extension workers, Twigiri Muhinzi, help us mobilize farmers um, for the annual tree planting days. Um, often it's kind of like a community celebration, um, and we found that that has been really helpful. Um, we do offer, as well in some countries, um, the option for farmers to buy low-cost seedlings, and we've worked really hard to get the production cost down, so it's very affordable. Um, I would also say another thing that's really worked is responding to the demands of farmers in the local markets. So, um, you know, 10 years ago, we were doing a lot of exploratory studies on um, what types of trees were most in demand by farmers, looking at soil health effects, um, all these different things. And today we offer um, over 40 varieties of trees, um, but that's localized to each market. So we found that farmers have really strong preferences about um, the types of trees that they want or don't want in each market. So we try to be responsive to that. So yeah, just experimenting with different models, trying to really reduce the cost per trees, um, partnering a lot, especially on mass tree planting days, and then being really adaptive to what smallholders in each of our markets um, wants out of their agroforestry. Thanks for that question, Yvonne. Thanks for that um, enlightenment, Claire. Um, we did have one hand raised, um, Yvonne. Oh, no, wait. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, no, sorry, you already went. I'm sorry about that. Um, Rhea. If you can unmute yourself. There you go. Yes. Hello. Hello. Yes. Thank you very much for this opportunity. And I thank do you. congratulate. Yes, I do appreciate and congratulate the Rika and One Acre Fund. Just a, a question for them is that 
I am located in Tanzania and uh, I'm in Tanzania Agricultural Research Institute Tari, which uh, which uh, conduct research and disseminate agricultural uh, technologies in the country, including programs that deals with conservation agriculture. So my question is, is that uh, uh, is there a possibility of collaborating with TARI in Tanzania also to increase this uh, important initiative for smallholder uh, farmers in Tanzania? Thank you very much. Thank you for that question. Um, Dr. Yerkon or Claire, any? Wanna take a crack at that one. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Raya. Yeah, yeah for, for us, uh, we are open to you know, collaboration. Um, in fact, uh, some of our faculty come from uh, Tanzania. Uh, so we, we get uh, human resource from, from all around. Uh, collaboration linked to you know, research but also to extension. And I, I think you could obtain our you know, contact and we'll be glad uh, to engage in further discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we had a question from Rose um, from the Farm Trail Foundation. Rose, if you can ask that and take yourself off mute. Okay, let me read it. I'm, I'm not hearing Rose, but um, the question in the chat is that conservation agriculture is a practice that can be deployed now to help farmers adapt to extreme weather and sloping terrain. Can Dr. Yerukun mention some of the conservation agriculture principles and how these practices can help farmers improve soil health and productivity? And then what investments are needed in terms of research? Dr. Yerukun. Thank you, Rose, for that question, and uh, I think for the uh, linkage to this uh, you know, forum here. Uh, there are three basic principles of conservation agriculture, which are accepted worldwide uh, and you know, primarily promoted by FAO, uh, which is minimum or no tillage, so little disturbance of the soil so that we don't you know, degrade it. Uh, secondly, we want to maintain land cover you know, throughout the year uh, to you know, avoid uh, erosion uh, and again, uh, degradation. And thirdly, uh, we want to practice you know, crop you know, rotation uh, so that you know, we have different crops that return residue to the ground and feed at different you know, uh, layers. Uh, what we have done is to, uh, in a practical context, uh, look at what else we need to do. And we have added for our own practices some good agricultural practices Again, looking at nutrient supply, looking at water management, looking at pest and disease you know, control. So we have you know, a recipe of these principles and practices which we share with our farmers and they, they can look at it in, you know, in context. Well, is it you know, easy? Uh, well, it is location specific. You know, we use these principles and for each location then you try to optimize you know, working with the farmer. The research that goes into conservation agriculture, again, because uh, you know, it, is, uh, it is not a new concept, but many farmers have been used to conventional agriculture. Research has generated a lot of information around conventional agriculture. And so it is a high cost uh, trying to do research uh, you know, in conservation agriculture. Uh, depending on the location, the question we are asking, for instance, weed control, uh, which is one of the key challenges even within that system. So it requires quite, quite a bit of you know, uh, funding uh, you know, to do that. Uh, we are lucky to some extent that the foundation, our Geographic Foundation, put some funding behind you know, what we do, uh, but we are also in a position to go out, collaborate and attract funding you know, from elsewhere. For those three basic principles, uh, I think are essential uh, for conservation agriculture. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. And we're coming up towards the end, but I do have another question in the in the um, Q and A's, and I'll ask that. This is for you, Claire, and then we'll probably wrap it up. Does One Acre Fund promote permaculture as a way of sustainable agriculture, and how has it ensured that local farmers are taught 
on sustainable practices and are in its vision aligned with Africa Vision 2063. That is from GSI Africa Eco 63. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I can't say that I'm familiar with Africa's Vision 2063, um, but I am a bit of a nerd on um, permaculture and um, agroecology and regenerative practices. Um, I'm doing my master's right now on biochar um, in Southern Africa. So um, really interested in, in that whole world. Um, I think sustainability is really important to One Acre Fund, um, but we also try to weigh that with food security. Um, and so I would say that a lot of the things that we do promote align really heavily with conservation agriculture or permaculture. Um, we're partners with Rika in Rwanda, and um, certainly a lot of the practices we promote, like compost, intercropping, crop rotation, integrated pest management, um, are really aligned with um, more agroecological practices. Um, at the same time, we're researching ways that we can reduce um, our fertilizer recommendations, and we have already in a lot of different places. But I would say we we try to take a really, um, yeah, evidence-based um, approach to that and, and try to weigh food security and also sustainability in our approach for right now. Thank you so much, Claire. And that um, is a great way to complete this discussion. I do want to thank really greatly thank um, Dr. Oliver and her colleagues at the State Department for allowing us to give our thoughts and um, members and partners of ours uh, of the Alliance. Um, as Eric, I know, introduced the Alliance Stand Hunger to you guys, but I just put my email in the chat. And so if anyone has any questions um, on for of the Alliance, feel free to drop me a line. And I believe um, Dr. Oliver is going to send out uh, um, some of the presentations, if, if that's okay, and, and some of the, yep, great. I guess, turn it over to you. Thanks a lot. Yes. So, Blake, we will share a link to the recording uh, for anyone that wants to view it. Blake, you are a wonderful host. Thank you, Blake. Thank you, Claire. Thank you, Dr. Yara Kuhn. This has been an excellent uh, community of practice webinar. I really can't express that enough. Um, our next community of practice webinar will be in October. It will be hosted by Climate AI, who will talk about some of their climate forecasting models. And so be on the lookout for a link and the date to attend our next webinar. Thank you, everybody. And for our repeat attenders, we also appreciate you all. And also our working group co-leads who are working on the policy papers that are present. Thank you so much for your continued engagement. Have a great day, everybody. Thank you all. Thanks, everyone.